we caught up with Kathy Feingold from the AFL-CIO, the American trade union movement that represents 12 million workers. She was talking about a report that they've recently produced, The Double Standards at Work, which looks at how European companies are abusing workers' rights and exploiting people in America's South. American South is a unique example in the United States of a low wage, low social protection model with very few uh, collective bargaining rights. Many of the states in the American South are anti-union. They actually have legislation that is called right to work legislation, which makes it very hard to organize a union. So many of those states are actually exporting this model and trying to attract foreign direct investment by saying, come to our states because we have a low wage model. You don't need to pay the workers. You don't need to um, support union organizing and we'll give you enormous tax breaks, which has real implications for the South of the United States. Well, first you have the framework of many of these states have passed legislation called right to work legislation, where workers do not need to pay uh, dues to the union, but the unions actually are supposed to represent them. So it's a way of undermining um, union power in those states. Very hard to organize a union. So one is the legislation. Two is the rhetoric from elected leaders, which is, you know, we don't want unions in the state. They say it publicly. Um, when we have organizing campaigns, they actually sometimes get involved um, and express their opinions that they don't want unions. So it's a very challenging situation. Um, and I should say this is a broader U.S. model. It is not just in the American South, but here we have a legacy of slavery. And you need to be clear that the form of capitalism that's been developed in the South of the United States really has its roots in the days of slavery, where, you know, it was slave labor. And so it's not surprising that today you still have those kind of systemic challenges to building power for working people and making sure they have decent wages and decent uh, social protections. The way many of these companies behave in Europe is completely the opposite. And their argument is actually we are just following the laws. And to some degree, there are stronger legislative protections in Europe, but that is not actually the answer. The answer is that they are taking advantage of um, weak laws, um, of big tax breaks, um, and of a historic um, system of, of slavery and of racism in that region. Um, and one of the things that we would like is companies need to walk their walk wherever they are doing business. And so many of the European companies publicly on their websites at the United Nations and other global fora uh, commit to upholding high road labor and environmental standards. And so what we're asking is that those same high road standards that they're committing to publicly on their websites in global fora apply as well to the United States. There is no reason that they can't do a high road model in the United States. There is no law against high road models in the United States. The real sto story here is also challenging a myth. There's a myth that workers in the South don't want to um, be part of unions. And this has been a myth that's been going on. And there's a myth that African-American uh, workers in the South don't want to be part of unions. And that is a complete myth. Um, we see time and time again from organizing campaigns that workers want power. They want to be part of a, a collective movement, of the labor movement. And so we're really challenging that myth. Uh, with these case studies. So we include various case studies from European multinationals. Um, and I think what you see is despite incredibly challenging conditions, workers are still trying to organize. Whether you're a worker at Fresenius, which is a dialysis company, um, you have a lot of uh, women and African-American women who are standing up and trying to organize. You have workers in Ikea um, who are also trying to organize um, to protect their rights. Uh, Volkswagen, many people are familiar with that story in Tennessee, where again, despite incredible pressures against the union, um, and then even the uh, government got involved in saying, you know, you might lose your job if you vote for the union, people still stood up. So the real story is, is this is super challenging, but that workers, regardless, are going to continue to stand up and try to exercise their full rights. 
Well, the report is really a joint initiative by uh, unions in the U.S. and, and unions in, in Europe with the European Trade Union Confederation. We need to strengthen our transatlantic partnership. We need to know that we can't be building picket fences between workers on either side of the Atlantic. We're all in this together. It's all about a corporate model that we need to take on together. And although we may have different circumstances, different levels of union density, different laws that protect our rights, it is the same economic model that's coming after us. So we need to be in it together. We need to have joint strategies that support organizing in these common supply chains, these same companies, take them on together. We also have in the report a whole set of recommendations for the companies themselves. They should be doing due diligence before they make the investment. What kind of situation are they investing in? What's happening in the communities? What's happening with the workers? Um, we think that obviously um, governments need to take both at the European, uh, the national level in the US, and at the state level, need to change their rhetoric, need to say we're committed to high road protections for our workers, because if not, we're never going to break this model that's leading to extreme levels of inequality on both sides of the Atlantic.